share the screen. Okay, hi everybody. Thanks for this amazing opportunity. I, I met like Angel several years ago and nice to meet it back. So um, today we'll be talking about, um, I can actually see half of my screen. Uh, okay, that doesn't matter. I can move you guys a little bit here. Okay, um, today we'll be talking about um, three, I would say, of the two most recent studies I performed in the lab of Marius Clor here at the NIH. And they both deal with uh, Huntington disease, um, specifically aggregation of this, uh, the protein responsible for that uh, using uh, NMR, solution NMR spectroscopy. So, uh, uh, so uh, who is the culprit for this uh, pathology is um, uh, an extension of uh, the, the Huntington protein uh, an extension of the polyglutamine track, which you can clearly see here in, uh, in red. Uh, this is the, what is called exon one domain. So that's from the first gene. And it's only like a hundred amino acids, uh, but it's very important for, for the pathology. Actually, that's the part responsible for the pathology. Hunted is a huge protein, more than 3000 amino acids. The this crystal structure was uh, resolved a couple of years ago. But still, this portion, small portion, is extremely flexible, so it cannot be resolved. So again, the polyglutamine tract can, for, for, for mutation, can extend. And if it's uh, individuals has more than 35 repetitions, uh, the disease is triggered and is an uncure and neurodegenerative disease, uh, which brings to what the, the most, the, the famous symptoms for that, which was described 200 years ago, is what is called Korea, so uncontrolled movements. Um, so let me uh, proceed. So the downstream effect of this extension of this polyglutamine domain is uh, the creation of pathogenic aggregation form of the protein, which can lead to formation of a bunch of stuff um, uh, up to from aggregates to fibrils. And what is very interesting for us is that the, the, the underlying mechanism of aggregation and the, also the precise nature of those species are ab absolutely unknown. Um, right now, the scientific community is moving toward thinking that fibrils are not only the responsible for the, for the pathology, and they actually, all those soluble oligomers that can float around the cells uh, are actually the real culprit, and fibrils are only considered a reservoir for, for monomers. So, of course, uh, trying to figure it out all this complex, uh, the complex scheme of aggregation is extremely important in order to design drugs. And I wanna try to convince you that NMR is extremely useful in this case um, in order to uh, describe quantitatively uh, this left side of the scheme uh, where we have only soluble uh, aggregates. And the other side, of course, is, is extremely important as well, but uh, that's something CRIM and TM and solid state NMR can deal with and is up to do with the characterization of morphology of this fibril. So um, when I started working on this project, uh, I started working on this uh, uh, kind of minimalistic construct of Huntington, bearing only seven glutamines. Uh, we, need, we need to use something which is, of course, doesn't aggregate over time, and is, uh, we need to set the equilibrium. So it comprises of an terminus domain, seven glutamines, and this extremely interesting um, domain, which is called proline rich domain, that has two repetitions, two poly proline stretches, one with 11, one with 10 uh, proline. So if you look at, when we start looking at the HSQC, uh, it's nothing really interesting, I would say, uh, like it's clearly uh, an IDP protein, uh, small dispersion of the chemical shift on protons and a couple of other, a second set of residues to the fact that we have uh, transient isomerization of proline. So the I minus one and I, I plus one residue might be affected. Uh, AUC experiment clearly showed that we only have a monomer, but that's not actually, actually, actually the, the reality. So when we start in performing some concentration dependent experiment, in the concentration of the monomer, let's say from 0 0.8 millimolar to, to 20 micromolar, we started observing some shift. And that's um, what actually uh, create this, all this uh, complicated scheme I'm, I'm gonna show you here. And I'm trying to convince that the right one. So um, 
okay, we perform uh, CT and relaxation dispersion, both on nitrogen and C alpha, as, at three different concentrations. Um, and also we measure uh, chemical shift. So exchange induced chemical shift uh, uh, through the dilution from 1.2 millimolar to almost zero. So I'll just say 10 micromolar monomer. And you can clearly see that um, those relaxation dispersions, so those profiles are extremely unusual because at R to infinity or to one kilohertz, the curves that, that they don't match up means that we cannot suppress completely the REX at one kilohertz and we are dealing with a very fast process. And um, uh, moreover, I mean, furthermore, I would say that the, uh, the exchange-induced chemical shift here, they don't show a linear, a linear trajectory, but the, there is a distinct curvature, which is clearly due to the formation of a higher order oligomer at according to our simulation. So that's the scheme uh, that can justify all the experimental data. We have two pathways, a non-pathway process that goes to a tetramer, uh, which structure we actually calculated, which is a uh, dimer of dimer. And the tetramer is, uh, uh, is made through a, a productive dimer. And on the other side, we have an abortive dimer, um, which is, uh, this process is extremely much slower uh, on the chemical shift domain. Um, so population is very small and the process is extremely fast. So fast that we not establish univocally uh, using all those experiments, this K minus two rate, which is uh, we only from a grid search, we kind of established it was more than 20,000 20, per second. So we came out with this trick. And the reason why we could uh, uh, complement our experiment with the Aaron Rose experiment is that uh, this process has a very unique feature. Uh, the Kx overall from E to E4 actually drops over, uh, over the range of concentration, which is very unusual if you look at cl a, um, a classical dimerization of unfolding folding process. And that allows us to, that actually uh, directly uh, uh, related to the fact that if you measure Aaron Rose experiment at three different Spilock fields, we can actually clearly see a difference um, um, and we can actually clearly, uh, I mean, sorry, the, the, they are too effective, it retains a huge sensitivity on very fast processes. And so we can establish univocally that this fast process was around 20, 23,000 per second. Um, so uh, since I don't have much time, I wouldn't, I will skip this, um, uh, the uh, how, lipid membranes and nanoparticle can affect the aggregation like say the Huntington. I will only focus on this, um, on the two binding partners we're actually interested in right now. One is profiling and the other one is SS3. So when I have, what happens, when I, what happens when those two proteins bound? Okay, let's start with the profiling case. Uh, this is a paper we published uh, uh, last year. So the first thing we do, of course, was to uh, perform some chemical perturbation map mapping uh, where uh, profiling was titrated with uh, exon one. And we noted that uh, this uh, very conserved uh, binding pocket, which is responsible for, which is known for binding proline rich domain. But on the other side, when we titrated Huntington, labeled Huntington with unlabeled profiling, we noticed two things. First of all, all the prolines here, so in the P11, P10 domains, completely broadened out. And we also observed some shift for the residues which are adjacent to, the, to, this, to those regions, meaning that profiling can bound to both the tract. So this is the, uh, the model that can actually explain the binding. And so we could characterize the affinities for binding using very simple experiment uh, I would say titrating experiment where, uh, where either uh, profiling or exon one was titrated with uh, uh, profiling or exon one. So by fitting all everything together, according to this model, we could establish uh, KDs, which is in the range of micromolar. What is more interesting is that we can also have two profiling bound on the on hunting thing, as you can see here, but of course the binding extremely negative cooperativity. Um, okay, so what happened once we knew the, the, the values for the affinity, we could, we could in terms like saturate antintin with the profiling, adding a, a, like around five millimolar uh, profiling. And so we, we could repeat all the measurement I repeated for the free exon one. So all the concentration dependent I showed in the beginning. And interesting, we didn't see any kind of uh, concentration dependent chemical shift, nor, nor on nitro, uh, neither nit and nitrogen nor on, on, on C alpha, 
meaning that the uh, complex of the EP complex cannot proceed any farther in the, in the dimerization along the off on pathway process. Uh, whereas it could pro still proceed, and that's clearly see from the presence of some relaxation, uh, some CPMG relaxation dispersion on, um, on the other side, on the, along the off pathway process. And that's kind of in line to what uh, Roy Papu said like in an amazing um, um, uh, nature paper, I think a couple of years ago, uh, where it look, it look uh, it really showed that profiling can prevent aggregation of of um, of axon one. So the other protein, and uh, this paper we just published like a couple of weeks ago, um, it's I would say more intriguing the way you play with axon one. So first of all, I decided to switch to something pathogenical, uh, pathological. Sorry, so with thirty five lutamines. Um, so this uh, constant aggregates over time. You can clearly see here. Uh, here I'm plotting the um, uh, the integration of the mite region of uh, uh, over time, and after 70 hours, uh, almost 80 percent of the signal is is gone. And what is what is left, of course, you can clearly see here from uh, the white stuff at the bottom of the Shigemi tube is uh, those fibrils, clearly picture from uh, uh, EM. But in the present of SS3. There is, uh, there is nothing, nothing really happens. The signal is stable. Uh, I also repeat those experiments uh, by looking at THT, uh, which is sensitive to the formation of beta, of beta sheet growth structure. And uh, you can clearly see sigmoidal behavior without uh, SS3, but when SS3 is added, uh, both the nucleation phase and the elongation phase get affected, meaning that um, this protein is really doing something uh, on both processes, both on nucleation and on, on elongation. So as for profiling, we measure, uh, we perform some chemical sheet perturbation mapping experiment on both sides. Um, nothing really interesting on the SS3, which is the domain is very well conserved, but what is really interesting will happen on the exon one side. So SS3 doesn't bind to both uh, proline stretches. And you can see there is no perturbation on the second one, only on the first one, which is here. Um, and you can only see from light broadening of, 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 of prolines, but we found an allostatic effect because this region here, the N-terminus region, uh, which is not supposed to be, which is not actually a binding site for, for, for SS3, is profoundly affected by binding. So, of course, to check everything, we perform some uh, control experiment where we're kind of chopping up both Q7 and the PRD domain and nothing really happens. So SS3 only binds specifically to uh, the proline stretch. So there is an allostatic event. So what, what, what is happening here? So um, in order to understand that, we need to we, we, I perform a bunch of relaxation-based NMR experiments and chemical shift mapping and all, uh, sorry, chemical shift um, titrations. And the result uh, is this, is a very interesting uh, binding scheme where um, uh, SS3 can bind to, uh, SS3 here is L and P is, is exon one. So SS3 can bind to, uh, to uh, exon one. Um, and of course, this is the most high populated uh, state, but the complex can dimerize and that's the source of uh, relaxation dispersions. And of course, we cannot consider, I mean, we have to include the fact that also each single ligand can actually dissociate from the complex, given this very interesting state, I call it P2L, uh, where the two protomers are not magnetically equivalent. So we have to consider the, uh, and that those have two different chemical shifts that uh, P can be either free or bound to L. So. Either way, um, the delta, uh, delta omega B and delta omega D clearly, clearly see where, where B is binding to the ligand and delta omega D is what happens because of dimerization, clearly show the formation of a um, helical structure uh, for this state and a slightly helical propensity for this state. So we, th we are thinking that the binding of SS3 actually can enhance the helical propensity of P and then that, that will facilitate the, the, the dimerization of the complex. So um, what happens, so why that, what, what is the explanation and why SS3 can uh, stop aggregation of Q35? So that's our current, uh, uh, current like I would say current state. So um, 
uh, what, we, what I did, the same thing I did for profiling, I saturate uh, axon one with, uh, with uh, SS3. Um, so we finish up having almost 70, 79% of, of PL complex. And then I perform some dilution. So the same thing I did for free axon one in the case of profiling and a measure chemical shift. So if P2L2 were proceeding toward another dimerization, P4L4, I will observe according to simulation um, um, uh, 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 a, a different shape in the delta x over the concentration, which is nonlinear, but in instead observe a very straight line. So that means that clearly, and that I think that that's an explanation for the fact for what is happening, what is happening, P2L2 uh, is blocks here, cannot proceed any further in any kind of more uh, dimerization. And that's, I think, that's the explanation for the reason why SS3 can, can stop aggregation of Huntington. So, Conclusion, um, yeah, so exon one can uh, nucleate, can oligomerize uh, uh, through a, a very interesting branched uh, pathways, two branch, I mean, a branched pathway, and off pathway, and off pathway uh, process. And both human profiling one and this three have an influence in aggregation. So we found to uh, the PRD domain in that attached. And whereas SS3 works on AD, so the, the first binding to P create an allosteric event that facilitate, facilitate the, uh, the, uh, the, the dimerization, but cannot proceed to the uh, formation of a tetramer. So that's it. Um, um, I would like to thank my uh, Marius Chlor group and Vitali, which is extremely uh, useful in all the kinetic systems, and the Chlor's group and the Bax group and all the uh, Facility manager Dusty and Jim found that the NIH are extremely precious to uh, keep running all these mechanisms, especially during COVID time. And thank you guys for the attention. Thank you very much, Alberto. Okay, so if you have any questions, please save them for the breakout rooms afterwards. Before then, we're going to go, go straight on to Jim. All right, thank you. I'm just going to, seems like I have a little bit of a connection problem. I'm going to turn my video off, if that's okay. Yeah, of uh, course. Yeah, let me share my. Uh, screen here. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Yep, looks great. All right, perfect. So hi, everyone. My name is Jim. I am a uh, fourth year PhD student at uh, Dr. Kevin Gardner's lab uh, at the CUNY Advanced Science Research Center. Today, my presentation is titled NMR Studies of Protein Conformational Transitions Induced by High Pressure and Ligand Binding. Uh, so as uh, many of you may know, that protein can often exchange between multiple conformations, uh, but it can be uh, challenging to characterize these transition processes because uh, it's difficult sometimes to uh, populate the, uh, some, some of the conformations or sparse, a higher energy state or sparsely populated pro uh, conformations. It can also be difficult to obtain uh, information about any of the transition states because they are transient. Um, so today my talk, talk will be focusing on one of the emerging methods for studying such transition processes, and that is called the pressure perturbation experiment. So pressure, it, uh, comparing to other perturbation method, is a more subtle uh, perturbation. Well, most of the pr uh, pressure-driven conformational changes are, are, are almost, I mean, I should say, most of the uh, pressure-driven conformational changes are, are reversible. And uh, using the apparatus we have, we can go, uh, we can access a really large range of pressure uh, uh, up to 2,500 bar. So just to put, put things into perspective, the deep, uh, deepest uh, ocean trench, the Mariana Trench only has a pressure of 1,000 bar. So we're really accessing a really large range of pressure. Um, pressure is mostly used for studying uh, protein folding and unfolding process because pressure can drive the protein to conformations of smaller volumes. So, and the unfolding, uh, unfolding, unfolded state of a protein is, uh, is, is thought to have the lowest or smallest volume comparing to any of the folded states. But in our case, we wanted to use pressure variable experiments or pressure NMR in particular to study the interconversions of a protein between folded conformations of different volumes. I will also talk a little bit about other, uh, other factors that could affect the conformational equilibrium of a protein. And that includes temperature, pH, buffer, protein sequence, and more importantly, uh, protein ligand interactions. 
So the protein we're studying here is called the ARNT pass B domain. It is a domain of a heterodimeric transcription factor. Uh, the the pass B domain is right here. It is uh, of particular interest because it is known to bind to other coactivators, and it can it also has a 100 cubic cubic angstrom internal cavity that is a potential site for ligand, uh, small molecule regulators. So uh, in, the, in the past, uh, when previous members in the lab were studying this protein, they identified that a single point mutation, Y456T, can split the protein into two uh, equally populated and slowly interconverting conformations. Uh, the biggest, and, and two additional uh, mutations can actually lock the protein in the alternative conformation, allowing structural characterization. So the one of the biggest differences between the two conformations is that the central I beta strand of this this uh, protein is shifted by three residues in this uh, alternative conformation. That's why we call it the slip conformation. Uh, so the <coughs> the uh, uh, sorry, let me just try to so so the the slip conformation. And uh, the two conformations uh, interconvert at an extremely low rate, a slow rate. And the slipping of the central beta, uh, beta strand uh, involves uh, tw 20 hydrogen bonds to be br uh, break, uh, broken and reformed. So we have a hypothesis that uh, the transition requires some sort of unfolded intermediate state. Another really big difference between the two structures is that the cavities that exist in the wild type protein now is collapsed in the slip conformation. So that creates the volume difference between the two proteins, uh, making the system really ideal for uh, pressure studies. The, the apparatus we use is a commercially available one. So there's a pressure pump and that is connected to a specialized pressure resistant tube can uh, sustain up to 2,500 bar. So when we want to change the pressure, we just pump water to this uh, NMR tube. Uh, the, the, the sample itself is separated from the water by a layer of mineral oil. So here are some of the data that we collected on the ARNT pass by 4560 mutant. If you look at the CHSXQC uh, spectra, you see that the uh, population, that the, the intensity of the peaks are changing with pressure. So that is, that is suggesting the equilibrium is dependent on pressure. Our focus is this pair of peaks, uh, this methyl peaks right here. Because these peaks are particularly upfield shifted and they are distant from any other peaks, uh, we can do uh, uh, characterizations using 1D NMR spectra. So, <clears throat> so, as, uh, so here uh, are the C13 edited 1D NMR spectra collected at different pressures. So we can monitor the conformational, uh, we can monitor the uh, equilibrium constant as the protein equilibrate at different pressures. So after we analyze this data, we can do thermodynamic and kinetic analyses, and we can plot the equilibrium constant and the transition, uh, forward and reverse transitions uh, as a function of pressures. And then we can fit them to extract the useful information, such as the volume and compressibility differences between the conformations. The negative signs here really suggest that the slip conformation is smaller and less compressible than the, um, than the wild type conformation. We can also get information on the activation volumes and compressibilities. So these values measures the differences between the transition state and the two folded states. Again, the negative signs uh, suggest that the transition state is uh, smaller and less compressible than the folded states. So now the question is how do these values compare to the unfolding volumes of these two conformations? So as I mentioned earlier, we can lock the protein in the uh, slip conformation using a triple mutation. So here we can use the wild type protein and the triple mutant to uh, uh, do a pressure unfolding uh, of, set of these two conformations separately uh, using uh, with a little help of urea. And then we can uh, draw the unfolding curves and extract the unfolding volumes of the wild type protein and the slip protein. And by comparing these uh, folding volumes uh, to the numbers I reported in the previous slide, we can estimate that the transition state is approximately 50 to 70% unfolded. So I think this uh, schematic diagram really illustrates the findings of the pressure study that the wild type has the biggest volume and compressibility comparing to any of the other states. And the interconversion requires a uh, intermediate state that is largely unfolded.
So what are some of the other factors that could affect the equilibrium? Um, so we did uh, find that the equilibrium is linearly dependent on temperature. Uh, the pH and salt concentration, on the other hand, don't really have any effects to the, to the equilibrium. And additionally, we found that the key uh, residue, muta different mutations to the key residue Y456 or additional mutations uh, with a Y456T mutation background, we, with all these mutations, we can also change the equilibrium constant. Again, all of these are derived from NMR experiments. So there's actually a reason these mutations can affect the equilibrium constant. Uh, that is uh, because, uh, so here I'm showing the order parameters and secondary structure propensities derived from NMR chemical shift assignments of the denatured, urea denatured state of the protein. Uh, three different variants here, the wild type, the single mutant and triple mutant. You can see that uh, <clears throat> all of these, uh, in, because of these uh, mutations, the residual structure in the denatured state of the protein are somewhat different, especially near uh, where the uh, slipping I beta strand is, uh, just before that the H beta strand has a significant difference between the three, uh, three proteins. So that is really suggesting that the mutations have an a, a effect to the residual structure of the unfolded state. Now remember that the protein have to partially unfold and refold back into one of the two conformations. Different mutations can, can potentially cause the protein to uh, preferentially refold back into one conformation over another. And that could explain why the mutations have an effect to the uh, equilibrium constant. So lastly, I want to talk about how we can use uh, small molecules to regulate uh, these conformational uh, equilibrium. So we have done a NMR-based screen to identify compounds that can bind to the wild type aren't pass B. So this really involves uh, grouping compounds together, adding them to the protein and look for chemical shift perturbations. And then we identify the positive ones and study them uh, uh, individual ligands and then do a in-depth uh, study with NMR titration experiments. Uh, at the end, we identify 10 ligands that could bind to the uh, wild type protein. And we, we counter screen this, uh, these 10 ligands uh, for their ability to bind to the triple mutant that is locked in the slip conformation. And it turns out none of these ligands uh, can uh, bind to the slip conformation. So that is suggests that all of these ligands are specific to the wild type protein. So three examples are given here, but the idea is that if we add these ligands to the uh, single mutant that is switching back and forth between uh, conformations, then we can potentially uh, bias the conformation towards favoring the wild type conformation. And that is actually, uh, that, that is indeed what we saw. So using 548 as one example here. So KG548 is a ARNT pass B coactivator disruptor using uh, mutagenesis studies and uh, X-ray crystallography, we, actually, we know this ligand binds to, it's a weak binder to the surface. Uh, when we add this ligand uh, to, um, to, the, uh, to the protein, the single mutant, we can see a, uh, we are losing the slip population and we're gaining the wild type population. We can also estimate the, the binding affinity of this, which is a 700 micromolar. This is a really low affinity ligand. But even with this low affinity, we can shift the equilibrium from one conformation to another. So, so that uh, brings me to the conclusion. So basically we investigated uh, the different ways that we could control the equilibrium of a protein between uh, conf uh, stably folded conformations. And in particular, uh, we showed that we can exert control over the equilibrium of this arm pass B protein using both pressure and ligands. Additionally, we found that there's a volume, there are volume and comp compressibility differences between the two folded conformations, as well as the transition state, and the interconversion proceeds through a largely unfolded intermediate state. We think these findings can really help us to uh, guide us to design novel uh, ligand regulated uh, protein switches um, <clears throat> by uh, characterizing how the, the interconversion process and uh, how ligand could affect the equilibrium. And these are, I think, uh, really generalizable. So uh, finally, I would like to acknowledge the funding agencies and my mentor, Kevin, and all the uh, co-authors and that uh, uh, of the two papers that are summarized in this talk,
and other members of our lab and uh, our research institution. And I thank you all for your attention. Thanks very much, Jim. Okay, so I'm going to pass straight on to our final speaker, Jacqueline. Okay, thank you very much. I just uh, shared the screen. Just one second. Can you see my screen now? Yep, looks good. Thank you. Cheers. Okay. Uh, Hi everybody, I am Jacqueline, a PhD student at the University of Warwick under the Lewandowski and Brown Group. And today we talk to you about one of the projects that I've been involved in and where we are trying to explore the possibility of characterizing the secondary structure of complex of data-tized docking domain and data ATC with solid state, combining solid state and MR and MD simulation. So first of all, I would like to start with a small biological introduction on what is the data ties docking domain and why it's important. The data ties docking domain that I will call DHD for simplicity from now on, facilitate the communication between the ketosynthase and the data tase in the multi-enzyme synthase that is involved in the production of the antibiotic gradurin, which is active against the mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, the DHD is an intrinsic disorder domain when not bound, but we think that it could actually fold uh, upon uh, directly binding of this on the surface of the DH. Uh, my project has been based on a previous study uh, that was taking place in here uh, at the University of Warwick, uh, thanks to the Charlie and Lewandowski Group, which is published in Nature, in which uh, uh, the, it, was, uh, it was determined the main binding region of uh, the DHD on uh, the D of the DHD domain on the DH. And it was proved with, uh, use, with the use of solution state and MR and uh, carbon footprinting a mass spectrum method. However, in uh, solution state and MR, it was impossible to get uh, any type of uh, spectrum for the, from the complex. And uh, it was impossible to get any type of confirmation for uh, the DHD domain. So we thought that we could approach this problem using a solid state and MR. First of all, because with the lack of tumbling, there is no actual contribution to, uh, of the tumbling to the relaxation. And so we thought that if we could observe the bound form. Uh, however, we had a problem in solid state and MR. We had a problem because uh, it was impossible to uh, transfer the polarization between residues. So it was impossible to get a sequential assignment. But what we were able to get, it was a, a residue specific assignment based on the J capping method. So we thought that we could uh, use that in combination with MD simulation. And we said, we try and see what we can get from that. So first of all, uh, we started with the solid state MR and with a residue specific assignment um, through a 3D toxi HSQC. Obviously, we can get the residue specific assignment, not a sequential assignment. So we are searching for some residues called key residues that are um, specific of the binding region and can act as a guideline for the secondary structure. Uh, we have here, for example, in the first binding region, the tryptophan, and in the second binding region, the methionine, uh, which are key residues because there is only one uh, um, one uh, tryptophan and uh, one um, methionine in the whole uh, in the whole uh, protein domain. Uh, we started and we were able to assign 60 out of 70 residues, and so we said we thought let's try and see if we can have a consistent uh, type of data from a CSI uh, um, chemical shift index and MD simulation. 
So we started with uh, an, an ambiguous example that is probably the methionine, which uh, I was able to assign uh, on uh, the toxic spectrum. And uh, the methionine on the toxic uh, presents uh, an index of anirix, which is consistent uh, on uh, or could be consistent with uh, the MD simulation. Uh, just a small introduction about the MD simulation. These are accelerated MD simulation, and what uh, this graph represents is uh, uh, the secondary structure that each residuous assumes uh, over time. So, for example, uh, the methionine has a tendency for the 30% of the time to assume a uh, IRIX conformation. So we thought we can start and see for all the other residues if we can, um, if we can assign a secondary structure. Uh, still on the second binding region, we have, for example, glycines that we were able to assign on the toxic all the four glycines. And three out of, out of four um, shows a random coin index, while one of them shows a helix index, which could corresponds to um, this, uh, the index, the MD simulation of the secondary structure. Um, this uh, can be done also if uh, actually not all uh, the residues are assigned. For example, in the case of, of the leucine, where, uh, three out, we, where uh, we were able to assign three out of four, and uh, actually one shows uh, uh, in the Helix index, which uh, as you can see here in uh, this uh, region between uh, 5 and 10, uh, PPM has a quite high propensity to uh, remain in a IRIX, uh, um, in a IRIX uh, status, in a IRIX secondary structure uh, for 70% of the time of my two microcircle and simulation. Um, at this point, uh, this can be done also on the glutamic acid, for example, but I brought this example because uh, we can have a step forward in uh, the assignment because the residues that are before the chlorine shows a uh, uh, alpha carbon chemical shift that is uh, around 2 ppm lower uh, than the random coil. So from that, uh, I thought, let's see if uh, I can assign and I can recognize the residue that shows this particular feature. And uh, I was able to uh, recognize uh, all of them, or I think what could potentially be um, the residues before the protein, which can help me in the assignment. Uh, obviously, this is a work in progress and uh, there is uh, still a lot to do, uh, but I hope that uh, I can, uh, I, I could make you interest, we can say, in. Uh, in, um, in to look at intrinsically disordering protein using uh, solid state NMR in combination with the uh, MD simulation. And obviously the next step will uh, be to try to get a sequential assignment, which obviously we can't be sure about that, but using a deteriorated protein. And uh, finally, I wanted to thank all the people uh, that uh, helped me and uh, collaborate to this project. Obviously, Joseph, my supervisor, uh, Matthew and Gregory for, uh, for the previous work, uh, Helen, Angela, and Trent for all the help and the time. Thank you very much. <laughs>